Hey everybody, this is Praxis. In this video, we're talking about everything related to food and emergency preparedness. If you have never even heard of preparedness before, if you've never heard of prepping, if you've never taken a single step in your entire life to get ready for any kind of an emergency, but you watch this video and more importantly, take the actions that I describe in it, you are gonna be way ahead of the vast majority of people out there. So let's jump to it. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running I always take what I want and I always give it 100 Don't need a bank, no I'm funded Play the game like it's nothing I'm always thankful for something Don't take for granted, stay humble Now waiting, better believe in your mind Cause it's everything You can mold, shape, find almost anything All right, so like I mentioned in the opening, we're talking about everything related to food and emergency preparedness. And we're gonna talk about it in a very basic way so that we can get you going. If you haven't taken any steps before, this is the basic stuff that you need to do to at least ensure that your family isn't going to starve to death. You're gonna have all the bases covered. Uh, there's a lot more that uh, you know we could go into, and uh, you know this is a continuous journey. You cover these bases and then you learn about other things. But what we're focusing on this video is how to basically make sure that you get the calories calories you need, get the nutrition that you need, and that you're able to store this stuff in a way where it's not going to spoil on you. And on top of that, we are going to talk a little bit about flavor and make sure that you can create stuff that isn't going to induce vomiting in your family because it tastes so bad. So let's jump right in. The first thing I want to talk about is how to store uh, stuff. You know, we're going to talk about the individual things to buy later, but storage is kind of like the first uh, step of everything that's coming into your home. I've got a bucket here next to me, and this is a food grade bucket. Uh, I got this uh, for free from a restaurant. A lot of times restaurants will get things uh, delivered in buckets like this. I think this one might have had pickles. It's a five gallon bucket. Uh, and this is number two plastic, HDPE. That stands for high density polyethylene. Uh, now there are a lot of uh, buckets out there that are made of high density polyethylene that you can buy that are pretty inexpensive if you don't have any friends that own restaurants. You can go to Home Depot and they have Home Depot buckets and they're like five bucks and those are high density polyethylene buckets. Uh, you know, there are lots of sources of these things. But the one thing that I should mention is that not not all high density polyethylene buckets are necessarily food grade. But for the purpose of this video, we're not gonna worry about that. I'm not gonna be putting soup in these buckets. What I'm gonna be using these buckets for is to hold uh, essentially bags of things that I'm uh, you know, buying from you know, uh, you know, distributors or stores or whatever. So I'm not really gonna be uh, stressing out too much over whether this bucket is food grade. Now, even if I wasn't gonna be putting stuff into these in bags, you know, like I said, Maybe I wouldn't want to put soup in here and let the soup sit for, well, by, by here, I, let's assume this is not a food grade bucket. Well, first off, what's the difference between a high density uh, polyethylene bucket that's food grade and non-food grade? Uh, virgin plastic buckets that are um, made of HDPE, uh, number two plastic, let's just call it number two plastic, that's a lot easier. Um, number two plastic means HDPE, high density polyethylene. Uh, the, the first time that the, the buckets are made or whatever is made out of high density polyethylene is considered food grade. Now, uh, uh, number two plastic is recyclable. Uh, once it gets recycled, uh, it can it can potentially not be uh, particularly food safe. And I, I use the word particularly food safe because we're talking about prepping, we're talking about preparedness, we're talking about taking the, uh, making the best uh, choices with the options that you have available to you. One uh, kind of critique that I get all the time here on my channel by people that just do not understand prepping at all is that they'll say, well, the thing that you described is not absolutely uh, perfect, it's not absolutely ideal. That's kind of what we're talking about here on uh, prepping channels. If things were ideal, we wouldn't be worried about there being famine uh, or wildfires or floods or wars or all these other things. Uh, in an ideal world, you wouldn't even have a disaster to begin with. So what we're talking about is doing the best that you can with uh, the situation that you find yourself in. So uh, for high density polyethylene buckets, number two plastic, uh, if it is virgin plastic, it is considered food grade. If it has been recycled, it is not considered food grade. But if you're putting something like rice in here, dried rice, not you know cooked rice, uh, dried rice or flour or beans or, th or th something like that, you're gonna have some of the rice particles or, uh, or grains of rice are gonna be touching the outside edge of the bucket. The rest of it is not. So for me personally, that doesn't really bother me that much. If I have high density polyethylene, I said I'd call it number two, but I keep calling it by the long name. If I have a number two plastic bucket, and even if it's not food grade, if I'm putting something dry in there, like dried beans, legumes, rice, flour, things like that, I'm not really gonna stress about it so much. Uh, are there potentially some chemicals that are going to off gas or do whatever and get into the food? 
yeah, that is a potential, but you know, the air that I'm breathing right now is polluted uh, from, you know, uh, coal fire plants all across the United States. I'm here in New England, where kind of the tailpipe of the nation with the way the prevailing winds blow. And it's not an ideal world. I'm breathing in toxins right now. There are toxins in the rain. There are toxins all over the place. Now that said, would it be good to minimize those as best you can? Yes, it would. But if you're having trouble getting food grade buckets because they're too expensive and you just can't afford enough of them, would you rather maybe get one food grade bucket and you can only store about uh, 35 pounds of food in one food grade bucket? Or would you rather get 10 uh, non, food grade buckets that are, you know, maybe recycled or something like that. And it's a little questionable and you can store 10 times as much food. Which of those is going to be more of a problem for you? The idea that maybe there is a little contamination, maybe in your buckets, or the fact that you only have one tenth as much food as you need and your family's going to starve to death, which is the bigger problem here. And this is the mindset. It's really important to get into that, uh, you know, it's not picking the ideal option, it's picking the best option of what's available to you. So if cost is a consideration, and it is for most of us, you can get very cheap buckets, like I said, Home Depot bu uh, buckets. They're not considered food grade necessarily, but you can get them for five bucks a pop. And uh, you know, it is still high density polyethylene. And again, if you're not storing like soup or, you know, uh, steeping tea in it or something like that, I'm personally not gonna be that worried about it. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the buckets, when you buy a bucket, uh, it sometimes comes with a lid, sometimes doesn't come with a lid. Uh, it oftentimes doesn't come with a lid like this. Uh, this is a Gamma 2 lid. And these are something that I think are really an important feature of uh, food uh, storage. This bucket, when it, uh, I got it for free, because uh, I you know, ha had the pal at the restaurant there, uh, it just came with a regular kind of snap-on lid. And those are honestly kind of a pain in the butt. You have to kind of work your fingers around them. And you know, I, yeah, I can do it, but they're kind of a pain in the butt. I really like replacing them out with these. Uh, Links to everything I'm talking about are down in the description below. Uh, these, uh, the prices of these fluctuate. They go up and down. Uh, I think uh, buying them today is gonna be cheaper than buying them a year from now or even like a month from now because uh, you know the costs of materials and energy and plastics and all that kind of stuff. At the time of this recording, these cost somewhere around $9 to $12, you know, depending on the color that you get. I'm gonna put a link to these specific ones, these Gamma 2 lids that I've got here. And the way these work is, this screws off from there. And when you get a bucket, you just take the lid off. And this is what you snap down onto the bucket. I'll, I'll be uh, totally honest with you. Uh, snapping these on the first time, it's kind of a pain in the butt. You got to really work them around and get that last uh, uh, corner over it. I end up usually sitting on it. But once you have this thing down on there, and I'll just get this one out of my way here. Once you have it on there, it's really easy to get into your buckets after that. They have a gasket on the edge and uh, you know, it, it makes it you know, airtight. Now it's not perfectly airtight. I, I'm gonna talk about what you'd probably wanna put in here, but it makes a really, really effective and very cost effective way of storing your, your foods. Uh, like I mentioned, if you buy a Home Depot bucket, they're like five bucks. If you buy uh, these things, they're you know, somewhere around $10. So for $15, you can have something like this that is going to store about 35 pounds of dry food. And that's a lot, that can get, keep you going for a while. Uh, and these are stackable, so you can uh, store lots of them. Uh, you know, if you live in an earthquake prone area, you may wanna uh, decide how many of these you wanna stack on top of each other. I do not live in an earthquake prone area, so that's not a consideration that I tend to have, but you wanna make them, you know, uh, you know, safe so they're not gonna collapse and kill your family. But this is a really great option for storing food. Now I mentioned oftentimes I will just put a bag of food in there. I will buy, a, you know, uh, whatever uh, type of food product it is, it's in a bag and I'll slide it right into a bucket like this uh, just because there's not really any reason to open up the bag and dump it in. You could open up the bag and dump it in. And like I said, this came right from a restaurant, it's considered food grade. Uh, but if you have a bag and you just kind of uh, can put it in just like that, that's, fine. What I will oftentimes uh, do with that is put a desiccant pack in there. That, a desiccant pack is like the kind of thing if you buy electronics is these little uh, things that say like silica do not eat or whatever on that. Uh, that is something that absorbs moisture. Uh, and if you put one of those in there, any additional moisture will get absorbed by the desiccant pack. I've got links in the description down below. If you want to use the desiccant packs that I tend to use, I think those are really important because you don't want to be getting mold and mildew in things growing in your food because that would be bad. 
So there you go. That is a really great way of storing food. People, uh, some people will also put oxygen absorbers in there. You can do that. It's probably, uh, it's not a bad idea. It certainly wouldn't hurt anything. I've never used oxygen absorbers in my 20 years plus, uh, you know, being into prepping and preparedness and it's never been a problem for me. I've never really had any kind of issue not using them. I always just use desk and packs and, uh, and everything's been fine doing that. So that is a really great food storage option. There are other ones out there. Uh, one of my favorites actually is called Vittles Vault. It's actually for dog food and cat food and things. I use that for actually the majority of my uh, food storage. I bought those years ago when they were much less expensive. Right now they've doubled in price. They're like 50 bucks for the, uh, the 50 pound storage uh, bins. I really like them. They have ga gamma lids. I'll put a link in the description down below if you wanna look at those, if you know cost isn't as much of an issue for you. Uh, but they have gone up quite significantly in price. And at the moment, uh, my additional food storage that I'm engaging in right now is going into this kind of stuff because it's a, little, it's a little too rich for my blood at this point. I'm glad I prepped and got them years ago when they were cheap and plentiful. Uh, but you know, at, the, at the, this point uh, in time right now, uh, this is more my speed. So I'll let you make the decision about what you would like to do for your, your food, food storage. Okay, so let's move on to the food that we're gonna be putting in here. Now I mentioned we're gonna talk about calories, we're gonna talk about nutrition, uh, and we're gonna talk about flavor. Let's talk about the calorie stuff first. Uh, I don't know what your particular diet is. Uh, here at this place, we're mostly vegetarian, uh, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of those things. Now, a lot of people have the sense that vegetarianism is like an expensive way to live because you know they'll go to the store and they'll see like a vegetarian version of a hamburger, and it's like, it's really expensive. It's also really processed, and processed food always tends to be more expensive. Vegetarianism is actually way cheaper. Uh, it creates a, a lower carbon footprint on the planet. That's one of the reasons that I got into vegetarianism. But one of uh, the other benefits is it can be way cheaper than eating, uh, you know, uh, meats and things like that. Uh, your leftovers last way longer. Uh, and the third benefit is that it's a very healthy way of living. So, uh, you know, whatever uh, route you might get into eating a vegetarian uh, diet or even eating a more or vegetarian diet. It's not an either or kind of thing. You don't have to decide I will never eat a whatever a cow again uh, and then like, you know, swear off it for the rest of your life. You can be like, instead of eating them once a week, maybe I'll have hamburgers once a month. And that would be a benefit to your wallet. It would be a benefit to the earth. It would be a benefit to your health. Uh, it, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of a grayscale. So, you know, you can go from one end to the other. Uh, at the moment, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle and I'd encourage you to join me somewhere in the middle because, uh, you know, out at the edges, uh, it's not as healthy and sometimes uh, uh, <laughs> not as delicious. So uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of vegetarian stuff, but we're also gonna talk about some, uh, some meat related stuff that we do here. So if you are going to buy foods, do it right now. You can still get grains and things like that for like, $2 a pound or less for organic, like really good stuff, and you can get even less than that. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is get some flour, some wheat flour, some uh, rice, uh, any kind of rice you like. I tend to get white basmati rice. You can get any kind of uh, rice that you like, uh, and some legumes. Uh, the legumes are going to give you fiber. The legumes are gonna give you protein, uh, and dried legumes, like these uh, chickpeas, right here, also known as garbanzo beans, uh, these are gonna last an enormously long amount of time if they're in dry storage. So I would highly encourage get some of those things. There are links down in the description below to the things that I tend to get. I tend to like getting whole wheat flour and white flour. I use whole wheat flour for my yeast starter. This is a yeast starter for making um, uh, breads and things like that. And make, keeping your own yeast colony, uh, I'm kind of like a yeast farmer here, is tremendously easy. The way that I start it is I take uh, two scoops of flour. I happen to use uh, quarter cup scoops, two scoops of flour, in here and then almost two scoops of water in here and then i just take a commercial yeast packet like from the store it's like fleischmann's or red star or you know there's all these different commercial yeast, yeast packets just the ones you get to get at the grocery store put one in there put the lid on put it in the refrigerator well i, I shake it around because it's kind of a liquidy uh, substance in there and then put it in the refrigerator and wait for it to start bubbling a little bit and then when it starts bubbling i dump it into a uh, bowl and I'll add flour and I'll add salt on there. And then I just uh, refresh what's in here. I put another two cups of, or another two scoops of flour in here, another two scoops of uh, water, almost two scoops of water. Uh, and I don't have to add yeast anymore because all the slime on the sides is all yeast colony. And then I just shake it around and I put it back in the refrigerator. And I just do that on a weekly basis. Uh, the stuff that I dumped out, I used to make bread. I add some flour to that, some salt to that, mix it up until it's the consistency of like uh, Play-Doh, maybe a little bit wetter than Play-Doh, uh, and let that rise, 
kind of needed a little bit, rise, needed a little bit, maybe rise and needed again. I mean, you can be kind of cavalier about this. It's uh, You can get different grades of bread if, if you don't care whether it's super fluffy, you don't have to knead it that much. If it's important to you that it's super fluffy, you can do more kneadings, it's really not that uh, difficult. And then you just take the substance after it's gotten fluffy, put it into the oven for about a half an hour at about 350 degrees in kind of a loaf pan or something like that. Or if you just have a, uh, a, a cookie sheet, you can pour it out on there and you'll make kind of a flatter bread. Uh, you can make all sorts of different things with it. So flour is a really great uh, asset. And like I said, I use whole wheat flour for my yeast starter. Uh, and then I add white flour to it so that it's fluffier. I could make it all with whole wheat flour. It'd probably be healthier that way, but I also want my stuff to taste good. And if your family Family's not eating it's not doing them any good so whole wheat flour and white flour you can buy those in 25 pound bags links down in the description below once you get the 25 pound bags you can pour one 25 pound bag into here or you can kind of cram it in uh, with flour it's actually a little easier to just dump it in uh, this will hold about 35 pounds of flour so 25 pound bag will will fit right in there so buy yourself some flour. That is a, a tremendous amount of calories. It's got some fiber in there for you and that will just keep people going. People love bread and it's a great base that you can use with other things. Next thing I would suggest getting is some rice. I mentioned uh, basmati rice is something that I get. I usually uh, tend to get just white rice. I'm keeping a bunch of it in here. You can keep uh, rice in containers like this. I'm gonna put links in the description down below to some of the rices that I tend to use. Uh, rice is a really easy thing for uh, you know, making a quick meal. With the, the bread dough I mentioned, you, you have to kind of wait for your yeast to be ready. Like I said, I do it on a weekly basis I, uh, by keeping it in the refrigerator. If I were to take this and just leave it out on the counter, it'd be ready like every day or so. I, it, it would have uh, refreshed its colony and it'd be ready for a new loaf of bread every day. But uh, if you're thinking about like a last minute uh, meal and you don't have that much time to put it together, rice is great. Uh, you take uh, one cup of rice, uh, and by cup I just mean scoop. It could be anything. This uh, is just a teacup. Uh, I could use that and scoop this much rice and put that into a pot. And then what I would want to do is take double that much water. So take two scoops of water and put it in there. It doesn't matter whether it's a cup, like a measuring cup or just a teacup. This teacup actually happens to be one uh, fluid cup uh, or like an old yogurt container that I just pulled out of the recyclables or a baked bean container that I just pulled out of the recyclable. It's all about ratios. Uh, you could literally take a, a mouthful of rice and, and spit it into uh, your uh, a pot to, to cook and then take two mouthfuls of water and spit those into the pot and you'd have approximately the right ratio and that's what it is about it's about ratio so don't worry about whether it's like you know how many like am I in the metric system or in the like dumbass uh, you know English imperial system or you know or what it's all about ratio so you take one part rice and two parts water put them together and you just get bring that up to a boil and as soon as it's up to a boil just kind of set it off to the side let it stay warm keep it covered and after about 20 minutes that'll be all puffed up and ready for you to eat it'll it won't taste like very much though so we're going to talk about flavoring in a little bit uh, but before we get there let's talk about some other kind of basic staple foods that you might want to have we mentioned flour, we mentioned uh, rice. Let's talk about another one uh, that is gonna give you uh, some, some grain, some nutrition, some fiber, some cornmeal. Cornmeal is a really great thing uh, that you can use to make all sorts of different things. You can use it to make like uh, Johnny cakes. Johnny cakes are kind of like a pancake, but with uh, some cornmeal mixed in, so it's not all flour. Uh, you can use it to make cornbread. Uh, you can uh, mix it in when you are making uh, a loaf of bread. There's a loaf of bread. Well, it's not an entire loaf of bread. It's a slice off of a loaf of bread that I just made yesterday. And whenever I put uh, bread into my bread pan, I always sprinkle cornmeal around the edges. It makes it release from the pan a lot better and it gives you a little extra nutrition on the edges. I think cornmeal is a great uh, thing that you can have. It's got a lot of calories. It'll keep people going and you can pour, uh, you know, 35 pounds of cornmeal into a bucket like that. So let's move on from cornmeal and let's get to uh, some legumes and things. Uh, these are the th types of things that are going to give you fiber. They're going to give you protein. Uh, the staple is beans. This is uh, pinto beans that I've got right here. Uh, I keep these in here in the kitchen so I have ready access to them. Back in my pantry, I've got them in big bins. I've got them in those uh, Vittles vaults that uh, I mentioned used to be cheaper and now they're more expensive. I've got them in buckets like this. Uh, beans like pinto beans, black beans, pretty much any beans, you're going to treat them in a very similar kind of way. When you want to hydrate beans, uh, what you need to do is just take the beans, 
put them in a pot and put water on them. It doesn't matter how much water you put on, you just want to have plenty of water. And you're just going to simmer them. Simmer them over a fire or simmer them over the stove or if you have a solar oven, which I would highly recommend, simmer them in a solar oven. Uh, you just want them to kind of boil for a while. Uh, if you want them to uh, not create as much gas in you, what you can do is make sure you change the water. So you boil them in just fresh, clean water, let them sit, uh, boil there for you know at least an hour or so. And then what you want to do is uh, change the water out. So you would uh, uh, pour the water out through a colander. Colander is like a thing with a bunch of holes on it if you're not familiar with cooking. Uh, here's what I use for my colander, which I think is kind of nice. Uh, it's just this right here. And what this does is it just goes on to the side of a pot. So if I was boiling uh, beans in here and I want to get rid of the water, I just take this, slide it right up to it. It's got like a little lip there, so it kind of locks on as long as you hold it. And you can pour out the water like that and then put some new water in, put it back on the stove and you're back in business. You probably want to change the water like two or three times and you want to just keep boiling them until they feel tender. Older beans are not going to get as tender as uh, fresher beans. And that is kind of, uh, that's a downside of uh, prepping uh, a lot of beans ahead of time. Uh, the beans are going to be useful and it's good to have them, uh, a lot of them in stock. So you have them if you ever need them. I keep a bunch in my stock, but fresher beans are always going to be more tender after you cook them. Uh, it, I found it doesn't matter how long you cook them, if they're old beans, they're always gonna be a little bit harder than the fresher beans. But, you know, I suck it up. It's, it's like, you know, who cares? And um, I uh, just deal with it, <laughs> to be honest. Again, you know, we're, we're not talking about ideals here. I wanna make sure that I have the food that my family needs, so I stock it so that if there were ever a shortage, I have it on hand. That said, when uh, we have a garden and we collect beans, that we have some fresh beans, and we do uh, eat those right away because, you know, they're fresher and, and, you know, they taste better that way. But I always am eating out of my st uh, stock from my pantry because I wanna kind of cycle through things. Uh, everything that I'm talking about here, by the way, in this video uh, has really, really long shelf lives. Uh, the flour that I'm talking about, I have used flour that is like easily five years old. Uh, the same for beans and rice and everything. These are things, if you keep them in a cool, dry place, and it is important that it's cool and it's dry and you keep it dry inside the bucket with the desiccant, and you keep it cool by keeping it in the place that is cool, like a, you know, a basement or a you know, place that you have air conditioned uh, or whatnot. Uh, it's important to keep these things cool, but they seem to have really, really long shelf lives, even without like, you know, freeze driving, drying them or mylar bagging them and vacuum sealing them and all that kind of stuff. They seem like they have really long shelf lives. So if you want to make beans, you put them in water, you let them boil for a while, you change the water a couple of times if you feel like it, you know, you, know, you could not change the water, that's fine too. Uh, and then once they're soft and tender, then you can add uh, flavorings to them. You can dice some onion in there, you can put some salt in there, you can uh, put, uh, you know, bouillon cubes, are good for it there. Why don't we jump uh, momentarily over to some of the flavoring things uh, that I wanted to talk about in this video. And salt is a really great one. I stock a lot of salt. Salt is something that our society doesn't tend to really value very much. It's just like, I mean, it's literally given away at restaurants. It's just take as much as you want from the table shakers. And they've got like all the little salt packets at the uh, fast food uh, joints and things that are just there being given away. People don't really value salt. Salt uh, at different times in history has been valued uh, at its weight in gold. Uh, there, I remember there was a, a trade in Africa between two different groups. One group was, I think, up in the mountains where there was a lot of salt, and one was down in the valley where there was a lot of gold, or it might have been vice versa. I forget the way that it was. But these two groups would trade salt for gold uh, back and forth. Uh, salt is tremendously important. If you don't have it in your body, your body falls apart and you die. So it's important to really uh, hold on to salt and uh, you know keep that as one of your stocks. Uh, it's also really helpful for making things taste better. Uh, one of the great uh, source of free salt, if you don't want to uh, pilfer uh, you know, your local McDonald's for it, uh, which I'd recommend against. You know, it's cheap now. Why not, why not just pay for your salt? But uh, there is a sort of source of salt that people are frequently uh, throwing away, and I've got a bunch of it right in here and it is the salt from like pretzels uh, if you buy any junk food uh, like you know pretzels or anything like that at the bottom of the bag there's always stuff left over isn't there i always take that stuff like if it's pretzels i sift it and i put it in here and you can see that's that's quite a bit of salt and i use that for flavoring things if i'm making rice i'll just grab a little pinch of that throw that in and it makes it so I don't even have to go into the salt uh, reserves that I've, I've purchased. Other things that you can use for similar purposes are, well, this is like different crackers and chips. There's some Cheez-Its, 
on the bottom. It's like a cheese cracker. There are some corn chips on the top here. If I take this and I mix it in with some beans that I'm making, uh, you're going to get the saltiness from the stuff. You get the uh, corn chips are going to break down. It's going to add some cornmeal into the mix, which is uh, delicious in there. Uh, there's a little bit of cheese uh, in there. Uh, it's going to add a lot of flavor. It's going to add some extra calories. It's going to add some extra nutrition. And this is the kind of stuff you're probably just going to throw away anyway. And you notice I've got it in an old salsa container. Uh, this is some spicy chips. I keep these separate, uh, you know, for just things that I wanted to make that were uh, going to be spicy. So you have all sorts of uh, assets like that. If you eat any kind of a junk food whatsoever, there's always flavor and salt and stuff like that left at the bottom of the bag. Just grab a jar, start dumping it into, into the jar, hold on to it, and you can use it as a flavoring, you know, just during normal times. Whenever I, uh, next time I make a chili or something, all this stuff is going to go right into the chili. So I'm saving money by not having to buy that stuff from the store. I'm, uh, you know, avoiding waste and it just, it feels clever. You know, it, figuring out things that are, kind of uh, open system loops that you can close and have the, the waste from one process become the fuel for another. That gives me a lot of uh, excitement when I do that because it just it's like a puzzle. The whole world's like a puzzle and the more you can kind of connect these tubes and make it so that uh, there's less waste, it just makes your life more efficient and you don't have to work as much uh, if you're uh, not spending your time and money on things that you plan to throw out, you know, you're, you're spending your time and money on things that you're going to use uh, in some other way, you, well, I, I think I've explained that far enough. Let's go a little bit further into legumes. So I mentioned uh, beans. Beans are really basic ones, you know, with prepping, there's a, like a uh, mantra where people talk about getting your beans, your bullets, and your band-aids. This is only about the, the bean aspect of it. We're not going to talk about bullets or band-aids in this. Uh, but there are other things other than beans that are a really good legume. Uh, one of them are chickpeas. Chickpeas, I, I think I read something recently that chickpeas are like the, like the number one protein source for most of the people on the planet. I don't know if that's true or not. If it's the internet, let's just keep that rumor going around. Uh, if it is true, it would make sense because they're a really great food. They're uh, really quick to, um, uh, to hydrate and uh, to put into use. They're really healthy. There's plenty of fiber in them. There's plenty of protein in them. Uh, and you can flavor them any way that you like. You can put a bouillon cube in with them. You can just put some salt in with them. I tend to like uh, mixing some chopped onions and garlic in with them, uh, plus a little bit of salt. Uh, and you're gonna cook them the same way that you cook the beans. You're gonna put them in just clean water and boil them until they're so uh, soft in the clean water. I used to think that if I put the salt in early, it would help to kind of soften them up and break them down. I, I thought about things like corned beef. Uh, corned beef doesn't have corn in it. Corned beef is called corned beef because you put little uh, pieces of salt into the corned beef and the, and the salt kind of breaks it down into those little stringy kind of things. The, the British people just always use the same word for everything. Anything that was small was corn. So like small, uh, like, well, corn on the cob had a bunch of small little grains, so they called maize corn. Uh, peppercorns are called corns because it's li little pieces of pepper. And uh, they call, apparently called salt corn when it was in small pieces because uh, that's why they uh, named corned beef corned beef because you had small pieces of salt in it. So corn, at least according to old British people, meant something small. So uh, I used to think, you know, well, the salt breaks down the corned beef. Maybe it'll do the same thing for the legumes. It's actually the reverse. Uh, if you put the salt in early, I find that it makes the beans uh, tougher. Uh, so always boil your beans in just clean water until they're soft and then add the flavorings. Another type of um, uh, grain that is a, a protein rich uh, grain is uh, quinoa. I've got quinoa in here. That's not one that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, it is, I think, indigenous to South America. Uh, and it's just, it's a great little grain and you can cook it in lots of different ways. You can cook it uh, as like a warm thing uh, where you just boil it in water and add like, uh, you know, salt or some kind of savory uh, flavoring, like chopped onions and something like that. So you'd make it with kind of a, a warm savory f uh, flavor. Or you could even uh, take uh, quinoa and you can mix it with milk and make kind of like an oatmeal with it. Uh, and that brings me to another grain that I think is really important, which is oats, rolled oats. I think oats are a really important way of getting some protein and getting some fiber and getting some uh, calories into your diet. They last a really long time. And oats are another thing that I stock in my pantry, um, it, you know, in really big buckets. In fact, I have more, I have more oats than anyone one. Uh, single thing in my pantry. I've got 200 pounds of oats that I keep on stock in my pantry. And I only keep uh, about 150 pounds of white flour and 150 pounds of uh, wheat flour. Together, I guess I have, um, you know, 300 pounds of flour, but you know, one's white, one's wheat. The, the, the single thing that I have more of than anything else is oats. And I think that they are a really great uh, source of so many different things. I'd highly recommend them. And oats can be cooked in lots of different ways. They can be mixed in 
if you're making bread, in fact, I have oats in this bread, I find it makes the bread kind of springier. If you add oats into it, you can make oatmeal uh, and you can add them to any, any number of other uh, types of things. Uh, primarily what I'm doing is oatmeal with it, bread with it, or like uh, granola cereal. I'll uh, take some, uh, some oats, some milk, and some granola, maybe some dried berries, mix it together, and that's a common breakfast that we have around here. Let's move on. Okay, we talked a lot about our storage. We talked a lot about the different kinds of grains and calorie types of things. Again, just to reiterate, flour, cornmeal, rice, beans, and oats, we talked about at the very end. If you get those things and you uh, get a number of them in, in buckets like this, you know, say like you get 100, at least 100 pounds of each of those, set that aside, you're gonna be in really, really good shape. And like I mentioned, a lot of these grains are even organic, less than $2 a pound for this stuff. So, I mean, the prices are still very reasonable and I don't think they're gonna get any more reasonable in the future. So now is the time. Again, links in the description down below to any of these things that we're talking about in this video. So let's move on to a couple of other things. We wanna talk about some more nutrition. I wanna talk about um, uh, some other uh, types of protein sources. Uh, first off, let's talk about a little bit of nutrition because we've talked a lot about calories, but what about like your greens and things like that? Well, I would suggest getting a lot of, uh, you know, canned vegetables. Uh, if you don't know how to can yourself, just start buying some canned vegetables. Canning itself is not really all that difficult. I'm going to talk about how to can tomatoes, which is what's in here uh, in this video, because tomatoes are a really, really simple thing to can. Uh, but uh, if, you're not, if you're not comfortable with that or if you're not familiar with that, just start getting yourself some, some canned green beans, corn, uh, you know, any of that kind of stuff that you could pair with the foods that you're making. Uh, you know, if you're going to make, uh, let's say, like rice, you can mix in some green beans with it. You could mix in uh, well, whatever vegetables you guys uh, happen to like, you know, whether it's you know, broccoli or whatever. You know, get, grab that kind of stuff. And what I would recommend... Uh, is canned stuff versus uh, freezer stuff. Because canned stuff, it doesn't matter if the power goes out. It's still gonna be good. If you're buying frozen vegetables and they're in your freezer and the power goes out, here we have solar backup, so it's not a big deal. But for most people, they don't have solar backup. So if you have the uh, canned stuff, it's gonna be shelf stable and uh, you're not gonna have uh, the, the worry of losing all your food if the power goes out. And trust me, the power almost certainly is going to be going out in, in the future. You know, not necessarily permanently. In fact, I think at the beginning, we're going to be looking at a lot of kind of like rolling blackouts and things like that. But I think the idea of uh, energy scarcity is uh, it's here and we, we have to start kind of adapting to it. So if you can can stuff or buy stuff canned, I think that's superior. Now I mentioned tomatoes are really easy to can. And this is just an old salsa can here. Uh, there are a lot of opinions about what I'm doing, whether what I'm doing here is safe. Uh, apparently in Australia, canning and reuse cans is just that's what people do here in the United States uh, you know some people feel comfortable with that some people don't feel comfortable with that from my own experience I have canned in like the real like ball jar canning containers the kinds you buy specifically for canning and I've uh, canned in these and I have actually had more failure uh, failures of lids in the ball like legit stuff that's supposed to be for canning I've had more lid failures in that stuff than the reused things. Uh, why is that? I think it's probably just a uh, random chance. <laughs> I don't think that the, the uh, professionals, uh, like real stuff is worse than, than the, uh, the, the reused ones. I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm just one data point and I, I think it's, I think they're probably kind of on par with each other. The one thing that I would suggest is that if you plan on uh, saving a lot of these things, save more lids than you do jars because uh, the lids from these can be, I have found they can definitely be used, reused once, and they can generally be reused a second time, but by the third time that you try your own canning, usually this kind of gasket is starting to fall off on there, and you're gonna go through more lids than you do glass jars. So if you're gonna be storing these things, if you fill up your, your, cab, your cupboard or whatever, and you're like, ah, oh, man, I got so many of these cra crazy damn glass jars that Praxis told me to store up. I don't have any more room. Uh, and you know, you wanna start getting rid of uh, some of your glass jars because you don't have more room to store them. Keep the lids because you're gonna go through a lot more lids than you will jars. Now, uh, one downside uh, to canning in these things is you can't put stuff in scalding hot uh, because it'll crack them. Uh, so you wanna put things in it like, you know, the jar is a room temperature, the stuff you're putting in is a room temperature. They can't take uh, real uh, sharp shocks to their system. Uh, if they do, the glass is gonna crack. So you can't do that. Uh, but beyond that, I find canning really easy. And I'm just gonna talk about how to do general canning, whether you're using reused jars or like the legit jars. 
for tomatoes. Tomatoes are a really easy thing to do because they tend to have a high acid content. Uh, there are different types of foods uh, uh, broken up based on pH. Uh, pH is how much uh, uh, acidity or alkalinity uh, they have in them. Don't worry, I'm not going to get too much into the science. But the more acidy foods are better for just doing very simple canning where you're just putting them in boiling water. The idea with canning is you, like what I did here is I just took some tomatoes, chopped them up, shoved as many tomatoes as I could possibly get into this jar and you can see there's like an inch of airspace at the top so like no matter how much you, get, you put in there there's always going to be airspace at the top. I shoved in as many tomatoes as I could, I put them into a bath of boiling water and I let them sit in the bath of boiling water for an hour. I probably could have gotten away with less time than that but I just like to be a little bit uh, safer than sorry. I, I think that the uh, the suggestion is somewhere around like 20 minutes or half an hour, don't quote me on that. Uh, I don't I don't go by that myself either. I just like to kind of overdo things and I usually leave them in there for an hour, especially if you're going to be putting them in when they're already cold. So the idea is have them boil for an hour and then after the hour you take them out. What I do uh, as a safety precaution for myself is even though I know that I can do tomatoes in that way, uh, I tend to just pressure cook everything. I have a good pressure cooker, so I will pressure cook things. And the idea of pressure cooking is that uh, the higher the pressure, the more you can raise the boiling point of the water that's in there. And the, uh, the higher the temperature that it requires before the water uh, boils off, the hotter you can get the contents in there. And for botulism, you need to make sure that the water is like 250 degrees. And if you know, and this is the Fahrenheit scale, the crazy old uh, English <laughs> measuring system, um, uh, on the Fahrenheit scale, uh, 212 is the normal atmospheric boiling point of water at like sea level. Uh, and 250 degrees, you can't achieve that unless you're in a high pressure environment. So I tend to just throw, throw things in a pressure cooker just because I have it. If you have a pressure cooker, why not use it? Uh, uh, the way that I do that is I just put my jars in the pressure cooker, put a fair bit of water in there. I usually put like uh, about two liters of water in there and that seems like it's good for uh, keeping it uh, moist uh, so the pot doesn't cook dry. And I'll just have it sit there for the hour uh, with it steaming at uh, 250 degrees and then I pull the things out. Uh, but the great thing about tomatoes is because they tend to have a higher acid content, you don't really need to do that. You can just do them in just a, a hot water bath and uh, it's just a great way of storing nutrition. I just realized a really important point that I should bring up at this moment and that is regarding botulism and how you can eliminate botulism even if it has developed inside your can. And this is something that I do every time I open a can that I have canned myself is I take the contents of that and I make sure that I get the contents boiling at a nice rolling boil for at least five or ten minutes. And the reason for that is that uh, boiling uh, the contents of it won't destroy the botulism organisms themselves. It won't destroy the spores of the botulism. But if botulism uh, had developed inside of the container that you canned yourself and maybe it didn't develop enough to pop the lid because that's the idea with those safety uh, uh, popping lids is if they're popped up it means gas is being created inside which means the contents of that container uh, you know isn't necessarily safe anymore. Even if there is botulism in there, if you take the contents and you put it under a rolling boil for five to ten minutes, uh, that boil is going to destroy the toxins that are created by the botulism organism and make it so that you're not going to get poisoned. This isn't something that I just came up with myself, like, you know, through trial and error. Uh, this is something you can look up, and I would encourage you to look it up on various, uh, you know, official uh, government and university um, you know, uh, websites and, uh, you know, data uh, logs where, uh, you know, people have experimented with this, and uh, creating that rolling boil for 10 minutes is a really great fail-safe so that in case there was botulism in whatever you just opened up and it hadn't manifested itself enough to create gases to pop the lid, you're still going to destroy those toxins so you're going to avoid uh, you know, giving yourself botulism, which is a really, really awful illness to be suffering uh, from. So taking that extra step to boil the stuff for five or ten minutes uh, is, I think, a really worthwhile thing to do. I always do it. I would suggest you do it if you're canning your own stuff and it can also protect you if you buy something you know, from the factory and that thing from a you know, food uh, distribution plant. Maybe there was botulism contaminated into that food can. Again, boiling that is going to protect you from that and I'll say it again, botulism is a really awful thing you don't want to get. So this is a great uh, kind of uh, prep that you can uh, engage in your life to kind of protect you from botulism even if it might be present in some of your food cans. Let's go back to the video. So, uh, you know, 
that's a great way of doing tomatoes. You can buy canned tomatoes if you're not familiar with the canning, you don't want to get into that. But it's important to get something, whether it's tomatoes or peas or, uh, you know, corn or, or, or some kind of a canned food so that you can uh, pair it with all these other things because nutrition is really important. I suggest stocking vitamins, you know, multivitamins, just have plenty of multivitamins so that you can supplement your family's diet with multivitamins if you're in a situation where you don't have as much nutrition as, you know, is maybe ideal. But have some way of getting nutrition into you. And I would say, you should just many ways, vitamins, canned foods, wild edibles. That's something if you're, uh, you want to watch more on my channel, I have a playlist here on my channel. In fact, I'll make a link to it right here. Oh. Mm. Oh. Mm. You do realize that's poison ivy, right? Oh, <coughs> oh no. Oh. Why are you stripping? Well, I use these to wipe my butt just before I was eating them. Oh. Are those leaves in your hand? No, the ones I already ate. Why oh. did you eat leaves? You wiped your butt off. Well, I I washed them off first, okay? All right. <laughs> About all different wild edible plants that are fairly easy to find. Uh, one thing with wild edibles is you don't have to know everything about every plant in the world in order to start picking them. Some of them are very obvious and you can just learn one or two plants and uh, you, you know, start with those. And I think that's a great way to kind of get yourself into it. And there are some plants where it's like, it doesn't have anything that looks similar to it that's dangerous. So if you learn that plant and uh, it has the growth character characteristics of that plant, you don't have to worry about it. You know that that's a safe plant once you learn it. Uh, so that, that's important. Get yourself a good book. There's a link down in the description below to a book that I really like. Uh, but if you can get yourself started down that road, you'll find that there's a lot of stuff outside that's just sitting there for free waiting for you to grab. Other things that you should have. I would suggest uh, some cooking oil. Uh, this is olive oil uh, that I've got in this uh, tin. And I think buying in these tins like this is a really great way to do it. It seems to last a lot longer. Uh, than if you buy it in plastic containers. In the past, I bought some big plastic jugs full of uh, cooking oil, and it seems like it lasts a lot longer when it's in these metal containers. I keep these in a cool, dry place. At the time of this recording, uh, this is the oldest one that I'm using right now. It expired uh, two years ago, and it's still totally fine. It, it, you can tell with olive oil because it, it starts getting a rancid smell, and yeah. Still totally fine. Uh, I've been keeping this in a cool, dry place, so I, you know, am maximizing its life. If you buy in the metal containers, cool, dry place, it seems to last a long time, and uh, it's, a, it's an important thing to have. It's going to give you calories, and it's important to get those fats into your body because I know in in our culture, it's like everyone's like <sighs> fat, keep it away. But fat is a really important part of uh, you know an animal's diet and a human's diet. It's it's why we crave it. You know, in, in our society, we crave sugar, salt, and fat. We, and we're like, well, well, why do we crave these things that are bad for us? They're not bad for us. They're really critical. Sugar is critical because it gives us energy. Salt is critical because our bodies need it to uh, you know keep up all of our functioning and uh, you know our, our chemical processes, you know neurons firing, all that kind of stuff. Fats are important because they are a slow burn and they're uh, critical for different parts of our metabolism. Th those three things our society is uh, demonized are super super important. And they're also, they tend to be super rare in nature. It's, it's hard to, you know, I mentioned wild edible plants. They're all over the place. You don't tend to walk around and find a wild edible plant that uh, is gonna provide you with a bunch of salt or a bunch of sugar or a bunch of fats. Uh, those types of things in nature tend to be pretty rare and that's why we crave them so much because they're super important and they tend to be super rare in nature. In our modern society, we've made them super plentiful and because people can't control themselves, they, uh, you know, destroy their bodies by, you know, uh, following their desires as they were evolved, you know, in a world that we don't live in anymore. I would suggest getting yourself some cooking oil. Uh, for here at our place, I mentioned we're mostly vegetarian, not entirely vegetarian. Sardines are another great way of getting uh, healthy fats into your body, also some protein into your diet. And these things last, oh my God, I, I don't even know how, how long past expiration these things last because I've, I've never hit the ceiling on it. I've eaten 10 year old sardines and uh, 10 years past expiration, <laughs> old sardines and Totally fine. I'm not going to say that's always going to be the case, but totally fine. In fact, uh, we recently finally finished up some of these 10 year old sardines here at our place. And we uh, moved into some of the newer, uh, newer ones because we try to always cycle through your food, always, you know, keep bringing new food in, eating the old stuff, bring new food in, eating the old stuff. We finally finished these old sardines and my boy realized he actually prefers the older sardines. When we opened up the new ones, they, they were like, they were really soft. And he was like, oh, I don't really care for these as much. So sardines, I think are a really great uh, way to go if, um, you know, if that is part of your uh, uh, diet to eat uh, uh, fish. 
a lot of healthy oils, a lot of healthy fats, a lot of healthy protein in there, and they last a really, really long time. They don't need refrigeration. I think that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to cover in this video. And if you have listened to what I've said, and if you plan on taking the actions that I've described in this video, like take them right now, uh, start grabbing some things for yourself. Even if you don't you know, have all of your storage stuff ready, order yourself some food. Just have it, have it heading your way. And that'll hopefully be the, you know, the, the kick in your butt once the stuff arrives to be like, oh man, I really gotta get some buckets. But you know, just start getting this stuff. Do something today because prepping and preparedness, like I said, it's not about you're either here or you're there. It's a constant journey and uh, it's all about trying to make your situation better. It's not about making your situation perfect. I'm always getting criticisms here on this channel where people are telling me over and over again that, you know, the things that I describe here, you know, there's a problem with it because of this, or it's a problem with it because of that. There are always going to be problems, no matter what, even if you're the most prepared person in the world. And I was watching a Canadian prepper video recently where people who have uh, no financial limitations on them are getting ready for what we're talking about here. Uh, you know, they're getting ready for the things that uh, their media uh, organizations that they own are telling us we're crazy to get ready for. Uh, you know, I, I'm more of a, a a fan of, uh, you know, look at what someone's doing, not look at what they're saying to kind of get the story behind what's going on in their head. Uh, but um, uh, even people that are not suffering from any kind of a means issue, very, very wealthy people are planning for what we're talking about right here. Um, but even in their situation, they're still going to have problems and they're, and, and they're dealing with those now. They're talking about like, you know, what are we going to do if like our uh, security people uh, revolt against us. What are we going to do if this happens? What are we going to do if that happens? None of these situations are ideal. If you have a bad situation, you're going to have a bunch of not that great options and you just try to do the best you can with it. And what prepping is about is to try to expand your options and to give you better options in the future than you would have if you didn't take actions today. So take at least some action today. Get yourself a bag of flour, a bag of rice, a bag of beans, a bag of uh, you know cornmeal or oats or something like that, or even just one of those. Start with something because if you've got yourself into a situation or find yourself in a situation where grocery stores don't have food or you don't want to go out because it's dangerous or uh, you know any number of other situations that I can't even imagine at the moment at the time of this recording, if you find yourself in that situation, wouldn't you be happier to have at least one extra bag of something versus not having that? Aren't you going to be in a better situation having an extra 100 pounds of oats versus having an extra, you know, 50 bucks in your wallet that you can't do anything with. So I'd highly recommend take some actions today. You know, don't make yourself broke. Don't put yourself in debt. Don't get yourself indebted to someone who's going to come and break your legs. You know, uh, you have to work within your means, but I think all of us, we can curtail something in our life. There's always something in our life that's discretionary. And if you don't believe me, uh, consider this. No matter how low your income level is, no matter where you are in terms of what your income is, there's somebody else in a similar situation of, in life that is making even less than you are and they're, they're still making things work. So if you can figure out how that person's living and adapt your life to be like theirs, keep your the same income that you have, but make it so that your cost of living goes down to match that other person that's barely scraping by, then you're going to create that little buffer for yourself, that little padding for yourself. And with that, you can invest that or, or you, you know, you could frivolously use it on something uh, or you can invest that into your future. No matter how rough your life is, there's always somebody who has less means than you do. There's always someone that has more means than you do, but don't focus on those people. Focus on the people that are living on less. Figure out how they're, how they're making it. Emulate some of that and you're going to create those little padding bits for yourself and use those padding bits to invest into your future, to invest in your future security. And by buying things in bulk, you're also going to be saving money. So the more that you engage in this type of thing, you're going to be uh, increasing that padding over and over and over again. When I buy a 25 pound bag of flour, I'm buying that at pretty much the absolute lowest uh, price that I can buy that for. If I were to buy that same 25 pounds, one pound at a time, I'm going to pay a heck of a lot more than I would if I bought it all in that bulk price. So once you can start getting things in this kind of a bulk setting for yourself, it's going to just a springboard and be like a positive feedback loop. It'll give you more and more and more disposable income as you reduce your expenses and increase your quality of life and your preparedness for a future 
so that you can increase your quality of life then. I hope you find this uh, video helpful. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you haven't found it too, too boring. But most of all, I hope you take action right now as soon as this video finishes now. <laughs> That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every week for new videos. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so through Patreon or PayPal.